I'll mic you up here. Well, first of all, um, the last time that I listened to Neil, um, it was uh, about this topic, and I learned a few things, and I used it, and it worked out really well. Now, keep in mind that he's from the other coast, but uh, a lot of the tactics are very similar, and you've got some uh, refinements for this side of the coast, too. Sure. So I'll, t- I'll shut up and turn it over to you. Also. Thank you, Phil. Well, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a great turnout. Like I said, uh, I think you guys have a fantastic meeting place here and, uh, support your store. Um, I, I helped found a kayak fishing club nine years ago and our meetings, we have 50 to 60 people showing up now and it's, it's fun seeing everyone get to be close and fishing together. So keep building that. Cause I think you guys, guys have a great thing going over here. Um, I'm Neil Taylor. Strike 3 Kayak Fishing is the company I own, and I am the only sole employee guide owner. And uh website I own, capmel.com, is probably the largest fishing website in the world. And I'll tell you that because I had to manually transfer everything over from Mel's original site to the new one. Um, great fishing resource. Uh, there's cards for that up here if you want to grab one. Check it out. Uh, Full-time fishing guide for eight years now. I'm in my 10th year total doing it. I do it all by kayak. Uh, I do it all by lures. I say that, and then I actually baited a hook this last week. There's a bunch of there was a bunch of littler drum around, and we had trouble. They were they were attacking the lures. We were taking the slam R and cutting the tail off, but we we couldn't get that many of them hooked up. So the next day we fed them shrimp, and we caught 30 of them. And reaching into a bait bucket was just, it was painful for me. So try and use lures as much of, of the time. And in talking with a couple of you guys um, before we, we got the program started here, uh, some of the things that I, I, I always hear some things, and people will say that live bait is an advantage, and I disagree. And... I believe there everything has its time and place in, in specific circumstances. Um, if you're after a sheep's head and you're trying to do it by a lure, you're in, you're in serious trouble. You may you may have some fly designs that'll work on them, and you can trick some sheep's head on the fly. But throwing any other kind of artificial lure to try and catch a sheep's head is a difficult t- task. Um, for pretty much all, almost all the other species we have. I can take an artificial lure and I can target them and catch them. And Phil asked me to talk on big trout. And I'll always say this, and I'm going to give you tips on trout, but it applies the same to every species. These these fish, they have their habits. And if you learn their feeding behaviors and you memorize their habits, your ability to intercept them and get them to eat and catch them should be very good and your results should be good. So, some tips to get that done. Um, One thing very different from where I am, from where you guys do most of your fishing, I come over here and talk about tides, and everyone's faces just gloss over. Um, Over on our side, if you don't study the tides and work the tides into your fishing plan, you're going to have trouble. Uh, I'm sure you, you guys have certain points in the tides that you you find success because i'm sure you find fish in certain locations based on the water height even over on this side over there it's more about the water movement and right now with the the full moon over um, we still have good moving water there's still pretty good opportunities we get into what we call the quarter moon phases and less water movement the fish get more inactive um Something you guys don't see as much in areas where maybe you don't have as much of that tidal influence. But that's a big one. If you're going over to our coast, I would plan your trip around the new moon or the full moon. If it's the warmer months and it's the full moon, you better be fishing in the evening. The morning bite on the full moon in the warmest months is dismal. So skipping back to trout, and I will, you know, I'll be giving you guys a chance to ask whatever questions you have. Um, targeting big trout, uh, something a lot of a lot of people like to do. It's probably Florida's number one game fish when it all comes down to it. Trout are the most abundant statewide of any fish that we have, and they're relatively cooperative as far as one to get to eat. 
and to have a little bit of sport out there. Um, you'll see up there in what's playing, uh-oh, what was playing up there, a mix of many sized fish. Jeff, you want to mess with that so you can get it playing again? I think the mouse is on the chair. Um, what, you, what you have with trout, and my rule of threes, a big one when I'm targeting trout, uh, if I catch three small trout, I'm going to move. If I've caught three of them and they're that, that similar size, uh, almost all the fish, when it comes to trout, will be of similar size. Now, we're talking targeting really big trout. Um, really big trout are rogues. They may travel in, in numbers of maybe one, two, or three fish. Um, when you're looking at those fish that I call the the solid, you know, overslot fish, which are which are 21 to 25 inches, they travel in more what I call packs. And you may have a couple dozen fish. You may have a lot more than that. It kind of depends on what's going on. But targeting the really big trout, um, something I suggest is go red fishing, especially if it's these months between now and April. The very biggest trout are going to be caught in a foot and a half of water and probably up up against some oysters. If you have areas that have oysters and where that drop off is off those oysters, that's where we catch most of the biggest trout on our side. Um, what you don't know is spawning behavior with trout. They spawn off and on year round. That's why they come back so fast after we have some kind of a calamity with trout. They're just constantly breeding. So we'll have it where we're on really good trout, and it's on the backside of the islands. I call the backside of the islands where I do most of my fishing around Tampa Bay. Um, you have all your seagrass on the protected side of the islands. All of a sudden, uh, for whatever reason, the fishing dies there. You'll have a gulf pass somewhere in the area, and everywhere where there's some rocks just outside where one of those gulf passes is, that's where all those big trout are going to go to. So, like to target them behind the islands. And if I'm after really big trout, I'm probably in water of three feet or less. If you're after a lot of trout, anything seven feet on down to three feet is about what you're going to do. Um, targeting techniques, I did not. Um, I did not bring in any of my topwater lures. I grabbed one of my rod and reels and. Got this, uh, that's the 12 fathom mullet. This color here is clear gold. This is actually, I brought this one in for a reason because we do a lot of trough fishing for the trout on the lowest tides. So in winter time, your biggest low tides correspond with sunrise. In the summer time, it's the opposite. You'll see the bigger tides are around sunset. So I'm probably going to be throwing the slam R when we're fishing those troughs. When the water rises and it puts enough water up against the shoreline, uh, when I go up there, you're also going to have the opportunity to catch redfish. You're going to catch a, a redfish, redfish, and then a, a great big trout, and it's going to go back and forth. And you may end up with five or six really big trout. And throwing this tail here, it's a more all-purpose bait around the Tampa Bay area to catch both. If you're throwing just the slam R up there, you might only catch the trout secret weapon bait, that buzztail shad. And part of the reason that is, it's got that sickle tail on it and there's vibration. So um, keep that in mind. Um, the buzztail shad and this mullet are what I call crossover baits. They're in both Producto and 12 Fathom. And people say, well, that makes it easy on, it's the same bait. It's not. The 12 Fathom lures are poured with hardener in them because of pinfish. Um, the, the freshwater baits are all softer, so throwing that freshwater bait in salt water, which I do all the time because I get the rejects and I see a color I like and I grab it and it's actually a freshwater bait. They're the first strike from a pinfish and you have a damaged lure. But uh, again, it's all about where you're going to find fish and then it's about what you're going to do to catch them. So, and I was talking to this gentleman over here. Um, this is a theme I have that uh, all my seminars I do, that are my repeat seminars I do over and over. One of my themes I have, I call it pace. 
And the concept of pace is you're moving your lure where it's within four to six inches of the bottom, whether the, the water is 12 inches deep or 12 feet deep. These fish live down there. They, they do not want to go too far away from the bottom to eat. And even more so, January, I'm not sure how dismal it was for you guys over here. Um, middle of January wasn't bad. First part of January was tough. The ending part of January was tough. But the clients caught big fish. And if, hey, there I am. The, the clients caught big fish. Um, but believe it or not, it was using tactics that you wouldn't have to use the rest of the year. And believe me, we got back to the beach and everyone else that's loading up, how'd you do? And uh, they would say, oh, it was tough. Didn't even get a strike. How'd you do? And my client say, actually, it wasn't, it wasn't easy fishing, but I got 17 fish. And every one of them big. And these people are like, oh, man, how'd you do that? Well, everyone's still out there. It's January. And they get that lure out there and they're skip, skip, moving that lure away at a fast pace. There isn't any fish, except for one day in January, there was no fish that chased the lure and hit it when it was moving any speed. There was three days where I had trips where the only fish that were caught were when the lure was not moving at all. I call them cold fish. They're cold-blooded. When, when the water gets cold enough and those fish cool down, they will still eat, but they're not going to move at all. They're not going to exert any energy to go do it. So that's what you have to do, your adjustments. Almost the same adjustment in August. And you guys have the same thing we have. You get super hot water over here, and these fish go down. They get miserable. You do the same thing as in August as you do in January. You slow everything down. Um, biggest tip I can give you on trout, you should delete this from the podcast. Uh, at this point, I want to interrupt the podcast. Uh, Neil was just about to reveal a really great uh, tidbit for uh, the fishing, something that you can hear when you're at the meetings, but something that I don't want to necessarily share on a nine-line forum that anybody can access. So hopefully this will encourage people to come in and actually attend the meeting. If you can't, this is a nice alternative, and the podcast will continue um, after I, I'm finished with this message. Um, the, uh, the opportunity that we get with some of these places such as Orlando Outfitters or Mosquito Creek Outdoors who have been very nice to host us, uh, after hours, uh, I just want to encourage people to, you know, the, the speakers are taking their time to come in, um, and, uh, it is a great shop, nice people. So if you get a chance, uh, come into the store, spend a little money, support a local business and get something out of it as well. Uh, anyway, enough said. Uh, back to the podcast. Phil. So you're out there, and how do you feel the difference between a redfish bite and a trout bite? Good question. How do you how do you know the difference between um, a redfish and a trout strike? Sometimes you don't. A majority of the time, I know what it's going to be based on location. But um, this time of year, when you get high tide and you're fishing up against the trees in a lot of locations, it's a flip of the coin. It could be either. And so what I tell people is, go ahead and set the hook. And if, if, you, if you set the hook and you don't get a hook up, on your next strike, you could consider not setting the hook because it might be a couple of giant trout laying there. But uh, a lot of times, the hook set works better in there because... When those big trout are laying up against the oysters on those tides, they're there to eat. And you're moving it along. A lot, of, a lot more times in that situation, trout will actually have the hook in their mouth than when you're fishing them in open water. Um, me personally, I can tell the difference on the strike. It's a feel. If you've, if you've caught enough fish, I could tell you the difference between a flounder strike, a trout strike, a redfish strike, a ladyfish strike. Ladyfish are the ones that almost bounce the rod out of your hands. You had a question? Same one. Okay. And you? Okay. Um, trout fishing, um, th those are the real big ones. Um, lure selection, I really, really like that slam R over any other lure. And the, one of the biggest reasons is it is shaped and resembles a shrimp. Um, more than the other lures in the 12 fathom line. 
That mullet looks like a majority of the swimming bait fish that we have almost all over the world. That's a great universal little little lure to throw there. The buzz tail, it's another one where you can you can use it and throw it and trout will eat it. I like the glide of the slam R better. If you look at the buzz tail and you look at the mullet, those are baits you want to swim and the actions of a swimming bait. Slam R with a flat bottom and a flat fork tail. That that is what I call a glide bait. Move it along and you can stop and let it go down. Hit the bottom. Anyone seen shrimp in their natural element? They'll go down and sit on the bottom. And they'll creep and they'll crawl. So letting that lure go down there and settle like that um, actually makes it resemble what, what the actual shrimp look like in real life. So you try stuff like that. Um, we get another month ahead and it's going to warm up. Um, you'll have trout that are laying there and sometimes they're watching baits go by and they're not attacking them. And then you start bouncing the rod tip a little more and you start getting strikes. And you wouldn't think it would be that way because I tell people a majority of the year, slow and straight wins the game. Um, but there's times where the erratic movement of a lure is an advantage. Be ready to do both. If you're not catching fish, change it up. It's going to come down to, am I in the wrong spot and there's no fish here? Or am I doing something that they don't like? But you try different stuff. I don't care if it's redfish, snook, trout. Uh, you're out there and you hook one. If you, yay, I got one, get real excited about it, it's a missed opportunity. Missed opportunity, what was I doing? Why did it eat that lure? Was I raising my rod tip? Was it dropping my rod tip? Was I reeling faster? It, that, that one fish liked what I did there. I'll tell you, if I can identify the technique I was doing, I'm going to try and do it again. And if it works again, I've developed one more technique that I'm going to add in and try all the time. And, you know, you develop five or six techniques and you're out there on the more difficult day where I call them unhappy fish. You finally get to one of those motions and techniques that they like and you get your hookups. Whereas someone that keeps doing it the same all the time, they may not get it done. So evaluate yourself. Be ready to make changes when you need to. Any other questions? Um, I've done more limited trout fishing on your side. Um, I have caught good ones. And from the first time I started coming over here, Craig's son, Mike, went out with him. I've got my rods, and he said, mm, you, need to put, you need to change out and put these tails on. I said, why can't I use these tails? And he said, well, those, those are your West Coast colors. You should be putting these on. And I said, well, what if I want to use the West Coast colors? And he said, hey, you're not going to catch as many as I am. Well, guess what happened? I put on a clinic. So this is something I tell people over and over. Um, having confidence in different lure colors, that's fine. Um, I'm more concerned about the movement of a lure than what color it is. And... You watch me when I'm out there, when the pinfish destroy a lure, even if I've caught three nice fish that day, every time I lose a tail, I'm putting a different color on. Just to try stuff. And the bottom line is, how I think it works out for me, I catch about the same number of fish on pretty much any color. However, it's always a however. If I'm after pompano and I'm not using gold or yellow, I put myself at a disadvantage. If it's January, February, and there's no bait fish around, and I'm fishing for redfish, if I'm using any color other than root beer, I put myself at a disadvantage. Root beer, root beer gold glitter is my favorite color when there's no bait fish around. These fish are eating, they're eating uh, snails, they're eating crabs, they're eating any number of other mud bugs and stuff that are down there that are that same color. So... There are certain trends. Uh, most of the rest of the year, I can really take a variety of, of the different colors and catch the same number of fish on them. So don't overthink it. You'll have your favorites, and that's fine. Um, but don't be married to them. Get some other colored lure, and that's all you have left. Don't go home. Put it on and see if you can catch a fish on it. Um, now, 
a big one that's going to come along, and I was talking about this before the meeting, I didn't bring any topwater lures in. Uh, I use the mirror lure stuff. Gary, you got a bunch of the topwater stuff around? Nice. Uh, I'm not Gary. I'm Rory. Yeah, Rory's there. Gary walked off. You guys got a bunch of the mirror lure stuff? The Miradines, um, great subsurface lure. Uh, the Miro Minnows, another great, nice little skinny subsurface lure. Uh, a majority of what I use mirror lures is topwater. And I'm going to get back into topwater fishing heavily in about a month. And the reason is, uh, throwing a topwater lure when the water's this cold over on my coast, not the best choice. Wouldn't know as much because I don't fish as much over on your side. Uh, water starts to heat up a little more and the mullets start to mature to a little larger size. The one species of bait fish we have that swims on the top nearly 100% of the time is mullet. When those mullet mature to about 3 inches long, all that people, that's all they want to do is throw top water. Now, you'll get worn out after 3 hours of, of banging a top water it'll start to wear you out but uh there's probably very little that's more exciting than watching a fish bang your lure on the surface um, so that's another option uh, top water is a big noisy bulky bait it's a good way to tempt some really big fish but uh you'll see you get you'll get an eight inch trout eat the top water lure that's six inches long so you never know but top water is another great uh option out there um, let's see, the, had a request today, um, Neil, do you do night fishing trips? Yes. Um, some of, like if you get to June, July, August, the, the trout fishing is going to be pretty easy and pretty predictable through the beginning of May. Um, get into late May, June, July, and... Everyone says the trout disappear in the heat of the summer. It's not true. They actually, they're, they're still there. They're feeding at a different time of the day. So I'll tell people, if you want to catch a really big trout and it's July, August, September, you should be going at 2 to 4 in the morning. And you might be going to places that are a little different than you fish for them the rest of the year. Um, I like troughs. Uh, Troughs with fairly deep water, more than six feet deep, and strong current. So areas that are near gulf passes where the water, water, water really, really moves rapidly, that's an area in the middle of the night I would look for a big trout. Um, finding them in the shallow is where we're finding them right now, in the good weather patterns after we've had, you know, warm up. Um, they're not going to be there in the warmer months. They're going to be there the next three months or so, and then after that, they're going to go deeper. They're going to become more nocturnal. So there's a seasonal adjustment to it, too. You have to know where they are for what time of the year it is. So make that adjustment, too. Um, size of your bait. Um, mostly, if you move something in front of a trout, they're agreeable enough. They'll usually eat it. Um, what you will have when all the bait... If there's bait fish around, but it's all tiny, the fly fisherman will beat the lure fisherman. That's basically the only time it happens. Rest of the time, a fly fisher might might keep up a little, but usually the lure guys get a lure down, keep it down. The fish have more opportunities to see it, but I've had it where the bait is so small, and guys throwing lures are getting next to no strikes at all, and the guy on the fly rods caught 20 fish in 20 casts. So... Sometimes the bait size has an impact. So whenever that happens, I have these, uh, I have my own fly tying vice. So I have these jigs where I just tied on a short bit of white fabric on it to where I just made a tiny, tiny jig. Kind of like this Blakemore jig I saw Phil have up here. Something about that size, chuck that out there, catches more fish when all the bait fish are small. It's another adjustment to make. Um, and some of the people were talking about, uh, you go over to Tampa Bay and you've caught trout, but they're on the small side. Um, it's all, it's about, all about basically knowing where to locate them. Um, I can pretty much look at all these different areas I go to 
and I can circle the spots on the map where I'm going to catch the smaller trout. Uh, where I intercept the larger fish is usually predictable, and then when it's been that way long enough, everything changes, and you're catching small ones where the big ones were, and you're not catching the big ones at all, or they, they've moved somewhere else. So you have to be ready for that, um, especially by kayak. You've got uh, point A to point B, point B to point C. In a kayak, you, if you have it mapped out, these should be short runs. I know people that when they move, they'll move 500 yards. And you do that four or five times in a day, I'll tell you, you're spending more time paddling and less time fishing. So you make a plan. If it doesn't work out, you don't find fish in the first place you're going. Where am I going to go next? And I map it all out. You know, like I said, it's a little different for us. Um, you got there you'll have, say it's a minus 0.5 low tide at sunrise. And that means a lot of areas are dry. That eliminates a bunch of, of area to go to. Um, you know exactly where to try on those tides because it's the only places where there, there is some water. Now you get about three hours into the incoming tide, and a lot of those places where you found the fish is starting to slow down. And what's happening is those areas that were dry, a lot of these fish will jump up to, to certain areas. I call them the intermediate areas. They're going to jump up to some of those areas and see what easy meal they can get out of an area that was dry. Stuff that didn't swim off there and stunned. Uh, then it's very simple. You learn to work your intermediate areas, and that's the toughest time to find fish. At high tide, I'll tell you, if you're fishing anywhere in the Gulf of Mexico side, and you're after these inshore species, if it's high tide and you're not making a cast within five yards of a mangrove limb, you're in the wrong spot. You have... You have to follow the fish to where they are, and at high tide, they are cruising those shorelines. Um, certain areas, you're, not, you're less likely to catch trout right up against the shorelines. You're going to find them somewhere else off the shoreline for some other reason. But redfish in particular, which I do a lot of on my charters, you're not going to catch any unless you're making a cast that's landing within two yards of the tree limbs. Got to work those shorelines on, on those high tides. Uh, positioning is important. Another big one of my uh, philosophies and themes is the fewer fish you spook, the more there are to catch. So I keep telling people, keep coming to the right, and they're keep going. So you're going to spook all the fish out of there. What do you mean? So well, if you keep going that way, I want you to come around here because I want you to make a long cast with the wind into them. I said. You get to where that, that edge of that sand is there, or within five yards of it, any fish that's in there is going to see you, and he's gone. Same thing, work on the shorelines. Uh, say it's not quite high tide, but it's getting close to it. Those fish, uh, a majority of the areas where I fish, they'll be five to ten yards off those mangrove shorelines. So in working those areas, I don't get five to ten yards off those trees. If I do that, I'm interrupting those fish that are moving up and down the shorelines. You stay out a little further and you let those fish stay in feeding patterns. When that water floods up higher, you want to get up a little more aggressively again because you want your lure in the strike zone longer. And if you're putting the lure up against the trees, and I don't do per perpendicular casting. People will make these short casts toward the trees and I'll say, why'd you do that? I said, well, try to get it close to the trees. I said, well, why don't you angle out this way and make a long cast down the shoreline and work it back through a whole bunch of area where a fish may see it instead of pitching it right there perpendicular and having it be in the strike zone for like a second and a half. These are the choices. It's about paying attention too. Did a boat go through there? Did a dolphin go through there? Did some knucklehead touring kayak guy go through there? Again, the fewer fish that are spooked, the more there are to catch. Uh, the one that always gets me, you move into an area. So here's another big tip for you in your, in your kayak. Drag your paddle to get your boat stopped facing the direction you want to fish. Happens at least once a week. I'll have someone out there moving them into position. They lay the paddle down. The boat's still moving. The boat turns 180 degrees, and they make a cast right back in the area we just paddled through. And I'll just kind of look and... 
Some people don't know. Some people are experienced enough, I'll say. I think I know where you're not catching a whole lot of fish. <laughs> That's a wasted cast. I mean, to cast through an area you just paddled through, that would be like casting through an area a dolphin was just feeding in. You just make good you make good decisions to maximize the chances that you will get a strike. So it all starts with casting. A long cast means your lure is going through more water. If your lure is covering more water, more fish have the opportunity to see your lure. The more fish that have the opportunity to see your lure, the more strikes you may get. The more strikes you may get, the more fish you hook. The more fish you hook, the more fish you're probably going to get to the boat. Making long casts, great deal to do with uh, planning. And again, I mentioned it two minutes ago. If you can make long casts with the wind, not only is that going to be the maximum casting distance, your lure is going to behave in the in the water better. It just is. Doing crosswind stuff with light lures, uh, you better have your rod tip down. That's what you want to do to to nullify the wind a little bit. You can sometimes that's your opportunity. Wind's blowing this direction, a fish pops up over there. You know, you want to cast further to the right to adjust because the wind's going to blow that lure there. But put your rod tip down. If your rod tip's up high and there's a crosswind. That lure is probably going to lean. Something's not going to be right. So you think about that stuff. Uh, heavier lure like a topwater, you can get away with stuff like that more. It'll cut through the wind. But uh, just good planning, stuff like that. Tips that'll help you. Um, in a kayak, you have the quietest way to approach a fish. I don't care. People have argued with me and say wade fishing's quieter. And I go, not the way you do it. You're sloshed around there. But, uh, I I never understood that argument how wade fishing is quieter than kayak fishing. However, um, there are eight different categories of loud people in kayaks, and it doesn't have to be that way. There's the anchor banger, which is the worst one. It's uh, They're into fish. They know it. They're going to get their anchor down, and they didn't get it out. I mean, you get there in the morning, get your anchor out, Get it hooked off to where you have it on the boat and put it in a spot where you can pick it up without banging it on the boat. That kind of planning is good. Um, I call this unnecessary noise, so don't bang your anchor. So the other one is get someone there. I'm like, yeah, there's fish here. and Say, okay, we're going to have you drop anchor here. And they pick it up quietly, and then they throw it. I call that the anchor chucker. The water's right next to you. Why not just lay it in the water? Not make that extra noise. Uh, just little choices like that, and it's. I'll tell people, and they're like, "Oh, I'm sorry." I'm like, "I don't care." So now you know. Um, unnecessary noise, uh, especially when you're after redfish, it's going to kill your opportunities. So, evaluate yourself. Uh, the buzztail shad. I mentioned that one a couple of times. That's the reason I I hooked up with the guys at Producto, and the buzztail shad. Back before we had the freeze out of snook. Uh, Average size snook that we caught, my, the number of snook that my clients caught 2008-2009 on the snook fishing trips was 12 per person. The average size snook was 32 inches. So the buzztail shad, skip back even before that, uh, 12 fathom was selling it. They called it the extractor. And then 12 fathoms, the, the owner just disappeared. And so I couldn't find that lure anymore. And someone told me, well, that's Producto Buzztail. So I called them. That's how I got to know these guys. And so they said, well, what's, you're using that in salt water? I said, oh, my gosh. I said, can you pour them any tougher? Yeah, we can pour them tougher. So I said, uh, what's the biggest appeal of that in salt water? And I said, well, I just learned that the redfish will eat them on days where the redfish won't eat anything else. But I said, that's not what I need it for. What I need it for is when I'm targeting snook in a foot to a foot and a half of water, wintertime mostly, when they're way up in the creeks, and those fish are spooky, and you toss any other lure in there, if it makes any noise at all, splash, it may freak them out. And you need a lure to be close enough to a fish, snook or ambush artists. And I'll give you a couple ideas on them too, even though this isn't really a snook seminar. But that buzztail shad... I can land it in the water, making zero noise at all. 
the design of that body and how soft that bait is, it's the quietest landing bait there is. So I could get that in there and move it past the snook. So you guys took a hit on snook too. Our, our area of Tampa Bay is still in very, very critical condition. We just had another major fish kill last week because of a sewage leak last summer, believe it or not. Um, it'll, t it'll take it a while to get back to where it was, but if, if you guys not have an opportunity, you know where there's some big snook here, um, uh, my suicide bait fish theory, if you're targeting a snook, you know where there's a big snook. If you cast a lure and you swim that lure straight in front of that fish, your odds on getting him to eat are about 15%. So... Snook know they're out there all the time. They know if they know if their if their prey sees them, they're gonna do something. So, if you know where that snook is, and you can get a cast beyond that point, when you get the lure to that location, you do what I call something extra. You could just simply reel faster. You could jab the rod tip to make that lure jump. Um, your your ratio on getting fish to strike if you do that goes up to about 75, 80 percent. It's a, it's a feeding instinct. They're sitting there ready to eat. If something comes into that range and then it speeds up, it's trying to escape, they're going to eat it before it gets any further away. So how's that different from trout and redfish? Trout and redfish, I do everything pretty much slow and straight, almost year-round. Even slower when they're cold fish, like I was talking about. But redfish, you want it on the move. Um... I'll catch redfish when they're the moodiest because the how I do things with this rod tip and big evaluation you want to have. How many of you here are still struggling to learn with lures? It's okay. The first thing you want to look at, those of you that want to get better at lures, the first thing you want to look at is your fishing rod. If you evaluate your equipment and you have an old, if you have an old fiberglass rod, you're not going to do very well using light lures to catch these fish. This right here, I know they have great fishing rods here. I, I'm not caught up on everything that they have here, but if you have a if you have a high quality, high modulus graphite rod, something that has nice feel to it. This one here, this one's a Saint Croix Inshore Avid, seven foot medium power moderate action. My my favorite's medium power fast action. But you want something that you can feel that lure the whole time. What I'm doing right here, this is why I can catch redfish when no one else can. How I'm actually manipulating the lure is with the rod tip. Fishing reel is just a device for retrieving line. What I'm actually doing to get those fish interested in that lure and eat it is right there in the rod tip. It's not like this. You do that, your, your lure's all over the place. You're going to lose control of the lure. This, it's this gentle. Reeling at a, at a continuous speed to pick up that line, but if you can mimic this here and get it at a speed and there are redfish there, you're going to feel boom. Then you're going to say, hey, that worked. And one of the reasons why redfish are different for fully seven months of the year, they're doing all their feeding down. They have an offset down mouth for a reason because whenever there's not easy bait fish like sardines all over the place, everything they eat comes from down in the mud and in the grass. So if I'm zipping that lure along and it's going through the middle of the water column, I'll catch a redfish every once in a while because they'll sense it when it goes by and I'll look and it'll be like, it's 10 feet away. I'm going to go back and see what this is down here. But if you can keep that thing moving at a slower speed, and you get his attention with it, and he turns, and it's a foot and a half away, he's going to give up on what's there. He's going to chase it and hit it. That's why learning to move the lure the slowest speed possible without hit, having it hit grass is key. And I'll show you visually what I'm doing with that lure. And I'll show it with this. doesn't matter. It's a slam R. Imagine this is that mullet. What I'm actually doing, if, if the bottom's right here, I get that lure out and control the lure at all times. Learn to click your bail over just before the lure hits the water. Have a tight line going straight into the water. 
If you don't, it, it sinks down, picks up grass right away, you're out of the game. Click that bale over, that line's tight, you have control of this lure. The bottom's right there, this is what my lure actually looks like. By what I'm doing with the rod tip there, it's cruising up, it's diving down, it's cruising up, diving down. If I feel it, if I feel it starting to stick on grass, I know I need to get a little bit more aggressive. Again, you're red fishing. A majority of your red fishing is in two feet of water or less. If it's two feet of water, that's probably a higher tide. And that's true for where you guys over here. Now Craig's starting to catch redfish. And the reason is uh, I got tired of fishing some of the canals and stuff with them. And then we'd go out and we'd be in spots that were trout. And then starting about five months ago, I said, let's go in there. And he's like, I'll get stuck. He's from Kentucky. And I said, if you get stuck, um, we'll just go backwards. And so we go in there, bang, hit redfish. So now he's got all these spots he's going to and catching redfish. He was always too deep. Get that one all the time. Neil, I want to catch a redfish. Never caught a redfish. Okay, we're going redfishing on Tuesday. Get him out there. I go, here's where we're going to find him. And I said, we're going to intercept him somewhere in here. First comment I always get. Wow, it sure is shallow here. Said, well, that's why you've never caught one. They're too deep. These fish, they stay in shallow water. That's a habit of redfish that's similar to you guys over, over here. For us, I mean, it's the same. You're just never going to find them deep. Over there, if you do find them deep, um, you're not going to catch them on lures. You might catch them on a bait. Catch them in the creeks. It's really strange. You'll catch... 150 trout, and you won't catch a single redfish, but if you sink a shrimp down there, you catch a 10-inch redfish right away. So they're down there, but they won't eat the lures. The bizarre behavior. Anyway, covered a bunch. There has to be a couple questions. Yes, sir? Do you fish in shallow water over grass? Are you fishing with a jig hand, or are you fishing with a plastic A majority of what I'm doing is a jig head and a soft plastic tail. Yes. Um, with the, the slam R and the buzztail shad, I do have weedless jig heads I can use. Um, I go to the weedless jig head when I have people fishing the trees. I call it treeless. Someone fires the cast in there, and you have the hook hidden in the plastic. It's easier to actually give it a rip and get it out of the trees. The main reason I use a standard jig head is it's a higher hookup ratio. It's an exposed hook. And I can teach people to, to get more aggressive if they're sticking in the grass. Again, once you know how your lure on that jig head weight swims, the only thing you need to know is how deep the water is. So that's all part of your evaluation, too, is how was I moving that lure? What's, what's the depth? Was I sweeping the rod tip? Was I dropping the rod tip? But you have to know what depth you're in. If, if you're going to learn it and you're going to start catching the maximum number of fish. So do you know how to, to know how deep it is? Other than looking down, which we can do mostly on our coast. It's a little tougher for you guys. This is my fish finder. People ask me all the time, your electronics. I'm interested in your electronics. What's your fish finder? Here it is. See that? Rod reel with that jig on. I cast it. If I catch one, I found them. That's my fish finder. You know what my depth finder is? If I can't see down, it's my paddle. Stick my paddle over the side, how far down it is. That's how deep it is. That's a majority of what we're doing is in that shallow water. Uh, the other safety of the paddle, get to you in a minute, Rory. The other, the other thing with the paddle beneficial, uh, to know how deep it is for getting out, to know what the bottom is. If it's mud, not a good place to get out. If it's oysters, not a good place to get out. If you can't see down there, and on our coast, this is even worse, nighttime, the big one. If you just dismount and you don't know it's there, you could get out right on the stingray. I take my paddle, and I'll go like this. If I can see down there, the dismount point, and probably four times in the last 15 years, I've hit a stingray by doing that. So, safety. Rory, what do you got? Are you kayak fishing at night? Yes, sir. Tell us how you Okay, um, the, my favorite light, the permanent light that I have on there, when I turn on, whenever I'm in an area where I could um, encounter a power boat, is the yak attack light. 
You guys have that one here? The Carbon Visi pull? That one there's the best light I've ever seen. The battery batteries last forever on that thing. Uh, incredible product. Uh, Luther is an innovator up there at Yak Attack. Um, I've got that on average in my in my crate that I have. There it is. That's that's the one. The flag on it's nice for daytime stuff too. Yeah, it's a storage bag still too. I think that it all folds up and you can put it in the bag if you want. Mm -hmm. So that's something there. If you're out at night, that's nice. Um, headlamps. Um, you can get headlamps all all sorts of levels. You guys have Princeton Tech here? Princeton Tech's one I use, but uh, I've got these ones I got. Yeah. Home Depot, you get a three pack for 20 bucks, and you just want to keep those dry. If those get water on, they usually get eat up pretty fast. But headlamps are nice for uh, working on lures, landing fish, things like that. Um, what I always have is, and mine's been a mag light for the last seven, eight years. You want one other stronger light for signaling. And you, you turn the yak attack light on whenever you, you know, you're just out in an area where you could encounter traffic but if i could encounter traffic i've always got my mag light actually in a rod holder right under my left elbow another big lesson for you everything has its place and keep it in that place and that that signaling flashlight's always going to be in the same place because that's something if i hear a boat motor all of a sudden i actually don't turn it on and point it at them i turn it on and i point it at my deck uh, before I cross an area like a channel or something, I'll sweep it both directions so someone knows that there's someone else there. But if there is another boat, which is rare, you go out night fishing, you've got it to yourself most of the time. But I want to illuminate myself the best I can if there's anyone else in the area. And that's worked. There are people where you hear a boat going, and I do that, and then all of a sudden you hear them pull back on their engine. Um, you make good choices. Um, you don't linger in areas where, you know, you don't fish the, the channels. If I do that, my kayak's probably pulled up on the shore and I'm wade fishing. Not going to not gonna get hurt that way. I go to remote areas where people are like, aren't you afraid of getting hit by a boat? So, well, no, because they would have to run over that sandbar that's exposed. Or they would get stuck over there because there's no way to get here on this tide. That's why we came here. There's fish here. And there's no chance of a powerboat being here. So you pick the right areas. You can get away with doing some stuff at night. But uh, good idea to have a compass. Uh, not a bad idea if you also have a GPS to take it on the night trips. Because you get something we have called sea fog. And you lose all your landmarks. Sea fog, you can't see your hand if you hold it out this far. And a lot of the areas I go, there's some landmarks. I can, I can follow a... Uh, a shoreline or I can follow a seawall but uh, there's other places I go where to get back to the launch I have to cross an open area with no landmarks if the fog's that thick I get that compass out and I can keep my heading and I can get there and I've tried this um, areas where I know I'm not going to encounter a powerboat in the fog I try with no compass and I end up further away than <laughs> where I started back because you get turned around that fog and you don't know it so nighttime, if you combine it with that sea fog, it's not a bad idea to have the compass with you 100% of the time because you could have sea fog in the daytime that could kill your visibility. But glad you asked, Rory. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that one. That's good. I should put that on mine, too, because I think I gave my compass away. I need to add one back. Yeah. Oh, he's got it there. Phil, put this up on your Facebook page and website so people know about it. Right. Right. Um, doing salt water, I, I always say that, uh, we don't, in salt water, we don't have trouble with snakes. In general, we don't have trouble with insects. And for sure, we don't see any alligators. It's rare. 
That's what the first time I came over here fishing with Mike from 12 Fathom. We're out there, and the sun's not even up yet. And I tap my paddle down, so I hop out of my boat and start wade fishing. And so, anyway, the sun's coming up a little higher. I'm looking around, and I was like, they got some funky-looking weed clumps out here. So I move a little bit, and I hop out of the boat again, and uh, freaking weed clumps going the other way. I was like, there's enough current here for that. And they go, hey, what's that thing floating over there? He goes, that's not floating. That's swimming. That's like an 18-foot alligator. <laughs> So, you got those in salt water over here? We don't have those over there. Yes, sir. Like I said, you, you're in a situation like that. You might want to change where you are. If you're if you're in a location where you think, yeah, very little chance of them being in here, it's a good place to stay. But uh, to linger in an area with thick sea fog where you could have a boat running full speed, you're rolling the dice. I was going to do it again. I, I just went home. Yeah. Somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. It's not the way I want to go. Um, sharks, the other one, uh, you're not going to have a problem with sharks. Unless you tie a fish off to your kayak. They sell fish bags here. Um, a lot of the boats can handle a full-size cooler. Get that. If you're going to keep a fish, don't eat rotten fish anyway. Don't eat a fish that's been dead on a stringer laying in the water for five hours. Take ice along, ice them down, because uh, I'll tell you, the year I moved here, I never knew anything but stringers. That's what we did all the fishing all my life. And I'll tell you, that story ends with, it's the day I learned how to make a pair of shorts out of a t-shirt. Because a shark ate the fish that I had on the stringer. The stringer was tied to the drawstring of my swimsuit. <laughs> and it was a big shark. And the only thing I could think of was I got to get I gotta get this thing away from me. It was also dragging me out the water over my head. Holding my fishing rod up over my head. And the tail of the shark's hitting me. And it was a 10 foot stringer. So I lifted my legs off. Off went the swimsuit. Swam backwards to get where I could stand. And then I got another problem. I don't have, I got nothing on. <laughs> so I walked over to the trees, put my fishing rod up in the mangrove limbs, and took my shirt off. And It takes a while to w work those armholes out to where you can put your leg through it. <laughs> Worst thing, no clothes in my car. So drive back to my apartment, and I get back there, I'm like, shoot. It's four cell phones. Couldn't call my girlfriend and say, could you bring me a pair of shorts or a towel or something? There's a pool party going on, and my stairs are right next to the pool. Had a lot of funny looks that day. But uh, never again. And the, the only terrified people I've ever seen with regards to sharks are people that tied a fish off to their kayak. And usually what it is, you end up with just a head left. But if, if it's a big shark and they inhale those, I'm going to tell you, a polycord stringer is not going to cut right away. And if you can't cut that or somehow get it released from your boat, I saw a kayak dragged under water once. And I've never seen that guy again. That's how terrified he was. And I told him to let go of his boat and sit still. And uh, this is the only time I've ever seen this. This is where I say the only dangerous shark is a threatened shark, which a hook shark's a threatened shark. He's attached to that polycord stringer, attached to that kayak. Now that his weight's out of the boat and he let go, I got that kayak moving toward him, so I was floating him away from where the guy was standing. Now I hear the guy walking in the water. I go, I told you to sit still or you're going to get killed. So anyway, I, I pushed the kayak where it's going toward the shark. Shark's still attack, attached to it. The shark turned and attacked the kayak twice. Mouth open. And I, here I had, a, I had a camera right there in my pocket, and I could have caught that. But again... Wouldn't happen if guy didn't tie off a big trout to the side of his kayak. Just, just don't do it. It's not worth it. Anyone else? I heard you mention uh, oysters. Mm -hmm. We have them, not a lot, but it's usually in the tidal flats up toward the uh, towards uh, East Murray Beach. Is there? Uh, we have a lot of flats, the sandy potholes. Is there a particular flora, uh, algae? 
seaweed, grass, whatever, that they seem to gravitate towards? Is there anything? Good question. Uh, locating fish, what's the terrain? I mentioned oysters, and you have some oyster availability over here. Uh, I would say the thing that is common between both coasts for locating trout, there has to be a certain amount of seagrass involved. Uh, again, you may get into those fish that are in troughs on the beaches. Um, usually those are in spawning periods, but 90% of the time when they're not in a spawning mode, I like the areas best that are a mix of grass and sand. Not solid grass, not solid sand. I like those areas that have a little bit of both those features. But uh, the grass is a habitat where not only are there food sources in there for them, it's also protection thing for them because over on our coast, I don't know if you guys have this, but uh, osprey will, they'll grab a trout if they can get them. And those trout can camouflage themselves a little better if they're seagrass bottom. They're laying, and I know where every sand patch is behind Honeymoon Island. And an osprey hits the water, and I'll look over and I'll say to the clients, I go, he's going to, you're going to see a fish come up with spots on it trout dumb enough to get in that shallow sand patch osprey flying by goes aha you know it's funny about osprey they go all that effort and then they eat part of the throat part of the guts and the eyes and throw the rest back they don't eat any of the meat but uh yeah there's a there's a disguise thing they're using the grass for as well but uh if you're not fishing where there's any seagrass and turtle grass eel grass those are our two main ones that's what you want algaes Fatter blades, turtle grass. Uh, I call it turtle grass, but there's some people tell me I'm wrong on that. But the thicker blade stuff I call the turtle grass. The stuff that's real thin that gets on your hook the easiest is the eel grass. It's all it's all good habitat, and uh, those are areas. If I'm after trout, I want to go where there's there's some grass. Yes, sir. Technique, form, speed. Uh, again, the biggest thing is you want a long cast. And I feel my lure from the time it's back here to start the cast until I've released a fish. So that lure's in the air, in the air, in the air. I can feel, I can feel it flying through the air. The line's tight. I click the bail over before that lure actually hits the water. I lay it in the water. It's basically my rod's out at an angle like this after a cast. I reach over and click the bail over at the right time. I raise the rod tip. There's actually two seconds that where I'm hovering the lure in the water before I have to start retrieving it. So that technique there, because he asked, if you're using a conventional jig head, how do you keep it clean? It's all about controlling the lure 100% of the time and keeping it from going down and snagging the grass. Now, you can't control floating grass. And when it gets back to when it starts to rain again, the weakest seagrass dies when fresh water hits it. Watch that. As soon as you start getting heavy rains again, boom, you got more floating seagrass. There's no way around that. Uh, I can tell when it's hung on the, the knot, the connection leader for the leader. I can still catch a fish because the lure may be, may be still clean. But if I make a long cast and I can be able to shoot, I got a, I got a piece of grass on there. I'll jab the rod tip hard, and then I'll reel fast to pick up the lure. Then I'll feel, yeah, I got that grass off there. Bang, and then I got a fish. That's better to do that than to work that lure all the way back and waste that 15 seconds with grass on your lure. Because if you have grass on, on your lure, you're out of the game. But again, it's, uh, it's all about speed. And the floating grass, you're going to have to fight that no matter what. Some of that's going to get on your lure. Try that. Give it a hard jab, see if you can clean the lure off. I call it clearing the lure. Give it a jab, and if you can get it cleared, you may end up still catching a fish on that retrieve. Speed and control. Who else? Yes, sir. Offshore? Um, yes. And... The, the best one for that is king mackerel, and that's usually in March. And you got to be careful. The area you're talking about, um, freighters come through there. 
and they don't have brakes. Um, you know, the other thing, if you go if you go further north to, towards Passa Grill, um, you're getting into surf launches. And this guy I took fishing, he goes, my buddies are going out for king mackerel. I go, oh, yeah? He goes, yeah, it's their first time. And I go, well, then there'll be some stories. So anyway, he gets the pictures, and he goes, they didn't get out. He goes, one guy lost all his rods of reels. This guy, he got swamped four times, finally gave up. And so he showed me the pictures, and I said, you know, I said, I caught 15 king mackerel there last week. <laughs> he, he turns to Snap's head and looks at me and go, all you have to do is launch 200 yards further down where there's no waves. <laughs> I mean, that's what it is when you're doing stuff like that. And uh, and that's big time, doing stuff over here, Pompano Beach, West Palm stuff. Those guys, they, they study the area. They know where areas are. They're going to have to deal with some surf issues, but you pick the right spot. Pick the right spot, you can still get past it, but... There's opportunities there. Up around Indian Rocks Beach is the other area that's probably probably the second best. The first best is probably Anna Maria Island, which is south. You go across the mouth of Tampa Bay. Anna Maria Island is where land starts at the opening of Tampa Bay. That's probably better than anywhere as far as an offshore kayak fishing opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, we tried it. Uh, there was a lot of carp that went through there. Yeah. Uh, and they kept telling me, it's like, oh, you know, if the waves come up, the waves come up. You know, we keep going out of the Atlantic, and that that was nothing. Yeah. But apparently, it does pick up like substantially if that weather pattern comes in. Yeah. But you got to be careful about that. Yeah, you get wind. It kind of depends on the shoreline too. You get the wind factor, but you get wind combined with current, and same thing over here. I'll tell you one place I would never put a kayak in, anywhere near Sebastian Inlet. Man, is that water move. But uh, same thing over on our side. Uh, we've got basically anywhere you go, if you have an east wind and an outgoing tide, if you launch anywhere near a gulf pass, you better stay away from that pass. Because if you have that wind and that current going the same direction, you're in a predicament. And I'll tell you, you are, because the way I learned it, I was in the fastest kayak I ever owned, Tarpon 160, and I was at a standoff, and I was trying for 15 minutes, and I, I might have been losing ground. I definitely wasn't gaining ground, but anyway, I had a brainstorm, and this is part of what I teach people is uh, stay away from those situations would be the best thing, but you get into a situation like that, so... I turned and aimed for Honeymoon Island, and the way the wind was, the way the current was, I didn't do it where I was paddling into the wind and current, and I, I did it in a manner where I knew I was going to hit Honeymoon Island, but it was going to be a half a mile down. And so, anyway, I hit it, I hopped out, put the kayak under my arm, and I walked the kayak back three quarters of a mile, and after I turned the corner around Dog Beach, then all I had to paddle into was the wind. As I got around there where you're, the current's cut in like half. So I've seen that in the Keys where it's coral and there's only a foot of, there's only a foot of water across there and the water's rushing across there. <sighs> Grab the rope, get out and walk across it instead of trying to paddle for half an hour to go 100 yards. Sometimes it's better to walk. But know what you're into. Don't go walking in sharp coral or oysters or anything like that. Just try and avoid certain situations. High wind and, and deep water with high currents is a good one to avoid. Yeah. Well, you want me to wrap it up? Because I, I don't want everyone to say, that guy talked too long. Neil, thank you very much. Sure. And you guys all got a raffle ticket, so I, I grabbed some stuff. So we'll go ahead and get that out of the way, and then we can let these guys get out of here. Thanks for keeping it open for the guys. This great meeting spot. And you have some of your cards too, because I know a few people have expressed interest in uh, okay. going to that coast. Do you guys send me a person to take groups now? Um, yeah, I do. I do a lot of uh, 